<sighs> anyway, welcome to actually is probably our first official um, masterclass on the all new MBA. Bit of a random subject, but uh, it came up in conversation in here um, a few days ago. And I thought, well, let's do a masterclass on it and just just do one to get going. Uh, we, of course, have a masterclass planned for next week, uh, the six departments of every business, large or small, and uh, we're going to dive deep into each of those and give you an opportunity to score and hopefully optimize and improve each of those departments across your own business. Anyway, that's for next week. Today, I want to talk to you about how to position yourself as an expert uh, it's a, an interesting topic, to be honest. Uh, please do just type in the chat if you can see and hear me, because I'd hate to get into this for 10 minutes and then find out that I'm not. So I can. Uh, yeah, fabulous. Right. Thank you, Mark. Um, fabulous. Yeah. Um, this actually, as a um, uh, as a realization, didn't actually occur to me until start until people started to I, in fact I can remember the very first time it happened somebody came to me at a networking event and said I've spoken to five people and they all said I should speak to you because you're the expert on whatever it was and um I remember it distinctly. It was the first time that I'd been, ref or I knew that I'd been referred to as an expert. Not just in this industry, but throughout my whole work life, I'd never really uh, felt or been referred to that I was aware of as an expert. Um, and then I was doing some other training, and I I I dug deep into the whole expert concept and did some research and put together this presentation. So, so I thought, well, let's do two things here that will support you in the MBA. Uh, one is to share concept with you so that you don't fall into the same mistake that I did, but also to give you some tools so that you can go away and, um, take advantage of how you can proactively position yourself as an expert rather than chance upon it. Because uh, I'm confident that most of the people that watch this video will have been in business long enough to be referred to as an expert, but may not be having that, you know, the enjoyment of that reference. So um, the bad news first, it takes um it takes up to 10 years this dr anders ericsson uh um is just a paper that he did did some research um that i've read all sorts of stuff if you read five books on any subject you're an expert there's all sorts of um interesting opinions on uh expertise and references to being an expert in my personal experience and my opinion there is no substitute for time. So there are things that you can do to shortcut, hack, and perhaps um, enhance your opportunity to be referred to as an expert. But you cannot hack ha the time element of it. And so I, I think, which I actually think is a good thing. So uh, because for those of us that have been in business a long time, it doesn't matter if you're still alongside somebody that's just spent 18 months getting all sorts of ologies and certifications and qualifications and everything else that goes with it, but doesn't have time uh, under their belt. So there, there is no substitute for it. So this is a reference point, all right, 10 years. And when I reflected and looked back, and I'm going to share my personal journey with you, um, it absolutely rung true for me. So th this this was from um, this um, uh, Ericsson's uh, research. 10 hours to become familiar with something. And um, two years ago, uh, 
at the tender age of 62, um, I put skis on my feet for the very first time. I went skiing. And this rings true for me. It took me eight to 10 hours to feel comfortable wearing skis. Um, I'm certainly not at this level yet. Have I skied for 100 hours? Certainly haven't skied for 100 hours. I've skied for probably seven or eight days. And the lot I went skiing in April, and I would say I'm starting to feel proficient. Okay, so um, six months. Yeah, so maybe over the next two years, I would consider myself, I, on the assumption that I keep going, um, I would become good. And then... Uh, if I'd been skiing for 10 years, um, I, not 10 years all at once, but over a period of 10 years, I would hopefully be considered an expert. If somebody saw me skiing, and I certainly saw some expert skiers, this is the kind of hours that we put in. Just see these as reference, all right? So, by the way, oh, Nikki, I didn't get a ding. Let me just wait for Nikki. Nikki, thank you for joining us. I didn't see you there. And uh, normally Zoom gives me a little ping to say that there's somebody waiting to come in and I didn't see it. So welcome. We're just getting started, Nikki. So you're fine. And of course, what will happen is um, it is all being recorded. So you'll be able to catch the five minutes that you've missed. We were just talking about skiing. Right. So use these as a reference point, really, um, as a yardstick. So... Um, and I know that there are people on our call now that have been in business for more than in their particular business for more than 10 years. And if you don't get to enjoy uh, or get referenced as an expert, that doesn't mean that you're not. It just may be that there's some things that I share with you today that you could be doing that would encourage others to refer to you as an expert. You know, you are the last person that should ever stand up and say you're an expert it should come from everybody else that that's the that's when the magic happens um right so let i i said to you i would on reflection once i did this research i did uh, i i kind of looked back over my work career um yeah that's me and um i looked at all the things that i've done throughout my um my time through to you know what i do today and um, my kind of timeline is 1978, I joined the police force. You could probably tell by the state of that photograph and the um, the porn cop mustache. Um, it was a long time ago. Uh, but I stayed in the police force for about six, seven years um, and didn't find that 10 year sweet spot. I then uh, ran my own business for three years, which was very successful and sold that business, made some good money. Um, but again, I didn't really get into expert status. Um, I then worked as the IT director for Marie Curie Cancer Care for five years. Again, no expert reference. Um, I then worked for a large tele international telecoms company as an operations director, no reference to expertise. And then in 2004, I got made redundant and I haven't worked today since. I got made redundant in 2004, um, which is now where I can't even begin to imagine where those 20 years have gone. But we've now had 20 years. It's the first time I've ever done anything beyond 10 years. And by coincidence, about 10 years ago, I started to be referred to as an expert. So, um, so I, I, I am a true case of the time spent uh, idea or concept that if you want to be positioned or referenced as an expert time spent there is no replacement for it so if you if you are somebody that isn't 10 years in yet or if you're somebody that is 10 years in yet uh, and you haven't started to have those references then there may be some things that i'll share with you now that you could be doing so again uh, this is according to research and speaking to people that I recognized as experts. These are some of the things that um, we talked about. Um, and what I'll do is I'll bring all these up now and then we're going to go into them in detail. Right. So uh, 
recognizing so if you would if you if you watch this video and you are just starting out on this journey um and you it's important actually it's not a case of wanting to be recognized as an expert it's actually important to be acknowledged as an expert uh, because the way that we buy nowadays days has really changed and we go to our networks to to buy and we ask our friends and our networks and that this is how it happened to me. Somebody um, went and asked his network, who should I go to for um, X? And they all kind of were pointing back at me. Um, so that is how the world has changed. You know, years ago, we'd flick through uh, the yellow pages. So but nowadays we ask our networks. So so being, you know, being identified in your network as an expert is really important. If you're starting out on that journey, Knowing that it's going to take a while to get that under your belt, you are actually 400 times more likely to get there if you know that it's a long journey before you start. Uh, I'll explain that in a second. Um, find somebody that will keep you, that will push you and will drive you, consistently drive you out of your comfort zone. We're very good at wanting to stay in our comfort zone. So I'm no different. You know, I, I in fact, I was have, sat here having a conversation with my daughter yesterday who's just about to start a new job. And um, we'd had several phone calls, uh, commute phone calls over the last few weeks uh, about whether or not she was going to take this new job on. And um, part of my encouragement was to get her out of her comfort zone. Um, start with what's important. We'll go through that in a bit more detail. That's the, the classic, um, 80, 20 train, like you fight, which came from an ex serviceman, um, ex Royal Marine. I'll give you some detail on that. The desirable difficulty or the desirable discomfort, as I like to call it, we'll cover off and study less and test more or study less and do more. We'll, we'll, we'll give you that too. So and solicit feedback right so the solicit feedback one get feedback practice does not make perfect so constantly trying to improve on something without soliciting uh, valid feedback doesn't it doesn't uh, make it perfect it may improve it but it'll only get it to a certain level it could make it worse if you are somebody that is a really bad driver if you practice bad driving you will make good your bad driving as in you will lock it in practice actually makes permanent it doesn't make perfect the only way that practice makes perfect works as a sentence is if it's practice makes perfect with feedback so that's when it works right so being for the long haul right we talked about this <clears throat> there is a correlation to um expert or rec recognition as an expert with as i've already covered with how long you have been in service how long you've been doing whatever it is that you do so and that's why i encourage and i know it came up with um in in a, one of the threads in the nba uh where mark talked about uh, i think it was it might have been keith actually keith blakemore he had changed um, when he founded his business or when he was established to how long he'd been um, uh, doing what he does. Uh, the There is a subtlety. And if you have been doing what you do for more than five years, I would highly recommend that you, uh, when you stand up, at a networking event when you are sending copy sales copy to somebody on your website on your email signature on your linkedin profile find ways to dovetail in i've been doing it for years and years and years is to say how long you've been doing what you've been doing so for the last 20 years i have um Oh, I can remember way back before the war, probably over 16, 17 years ago, I was talking to a client. So find ways in which you can um, kind of drop in and and create a marker 
so the, there's a subtlety in um, in in the sales flow that lets people know how long you've been doing what you've been doing because it triggers an expectation that you're an expert. Um, <clears throat> committing in advance will increase your chances by up to 400%. Right. So what this basically means, the studies that were done, those people that knew how long something was going to take before they set off planned both mentally and physically accordingly and were up to 400% more likely to reach that destination. If you'd said to me, if I, if I said to you in 2004, my goal, I, I want to be recognized as an expert in this, and I watched this presentation, I'm not wholly sure how <laughs> how happy I'd have felt if, if I knew that this is, holy moly, is this going to take me 10 years? Um, the, the truth is, I just got my head down and just got on with what I do, uh, and it, it kind of came back at me. Um, if you know how long something is going to take you and you and you want to achieve whatever that is you know if i wanted to learn to fly a plane and i know that on average it takes three to five years to get a pilot's license in the uk um if if that's shared with me before i start off on that journey i am more likely to get there so so anything that irrespective of this it's worth noting anything that you're thinking of doing once you know and appreciate, even if it's not told to you, ask, you know, how roughly how long will this take? Um, you're more likely to get there because mentally and physically you prep. So if you just meander along and you don't know, um, uh, very often we kind of stop. So we don't get there. This isn't a sales pitch. It's a fact. So um, I'm fairly confident in saying if it's not 100%, it'll be 99% recurring of every Olympic athlete has a coach or a mentor of some description because they will get you to do things that your brain says you can't do. It'll get you to do things that your brain says you don't want to do. Um, if you have somebody that's trodden a path that you want to tread, as in a mentor, for example, they will help you avoid mistakes. Um, they will encourage, coerce. They will be unreasonable. In fact, I've got it on here. You know, they're happy to be unreasonable. All I would say to you is when you seek out these people uh, to support you, make sure that they're that their benevolence levels are high, that their interest is in you. Um, like no different to a dentist or a doctor, these people, under most of them undertake these professions because they're trying to earn a living. Coaches and mentors, obviously I do. You, know, I need to earn a living. But make sure their heart and their, their interest is in the right place because... You need to find somebody that is genuinely interested in making sure that you succeed. So it, it's not about, you know, them earning the money. So all I can say, say to you is that after 20 years, um, having somebody keeping you uh, driven and, you know, when, when you're struggling, getting you into a place where you might, might not think you can go or you don't want to go, gets you over the humps right so it's important right the um 80 20 rule uh, applies here uh let me give you some real life examples by starting with what's important to so, um expertise we're talking about expertise here this is really about um making sure that you are concentrating on the elements that will give you the best or most return the, the the smart ones know that um if you are if you desperately need to increase your revenues for example then spending time uh doing spreadsheets isn't going to help you generate revenue spending time marketing is going to 
generate revenue. So concentrating on those small pieces that give you the maximum return um, is, is kind of where it's at. Getting caught or finding yourself doing things that you think are important but won't give you the important return you know, is a, a, a trap that we often fall into. So spending time to save money, speed, like the, I've used speed reading here as an example. If I spend, um, if I was to spend 10 minutes looking at a book, reading the um, preface and understanding what the book is going to tell me, looking at the chapters um, and having a basic understanding of what that book will give me, identifying what I want from the book before I start to read the book will speed up that process. So spending time will save me time further down the line. Two examples for you. Train like you fight. Um, I can remember sitting down having a coffee with this guy uh, when we went through the whole um, how the Marines are taught. Um, and it reminded me of a big failure that I made at school um, is that when I did my mock exams way back in the 1970s uh there was no gcses it was cses and gces uh for those that are old enough to remember that um sorry barry i don't get a ping i usually get a noise to say that somebody wants to join and that's two people that have joined i didn't get the ping right so at school the mistake that i made was I and they were entitled mocks, right? So they were mock exams. They were training exams. What I didn't appreciate, and so I didn't take them seriously. So, and what I didn't appreciate is uh, back in the day that your mock exams are designed to tell the um, people that set the exams which exam you should be submitted for. And as a young, spotty 15-year-old, I didn't take my mock seriously. And so I wasn't given the opportunity to take the higher level exams because I didn't take them seriously. So um, boxing is a good example. If you watch somebody sparring uh, or shadow boxing, they are especially at a professional level, they are sparring and they are uh, shadow boxing as if they were fighting. So mentally, you have to put yourself into a place where you imagine you imagine that this is for real. So um, the, the whole mock approach for me um, was the key here. There's a huge difference between knowledge and learning there. I, today, you will learn nothing. You will learn absolutely nothing. This is just knowledge. You can't learn to drive from a masterclass or a book. You can only learn to drive by getting behind the wheel. You cannot learn to box or ski or ride a bike or play the drums by watching videos. You have to do. So uh, the environment matters. So if I spend my time in the junior leagues and I am at professional level, I will downgrade my return. So all, and it comes back to that whole thing about pushing yourself to a level where you feel uncomfortable and you're outside your comfort zone. And I'm guilty of it. Um, I, I uh, have often enjoyed uh, positioning myself and surrounded my surrounded myself with um, uh, people that hadn't got as much experience at me as me because it made me feel good knowing that I was better than them doesn't help me improve so so the environment definitely makes a difference feeling a little bit and this is the conversation I was having with my daughter yesterday feeling a little bit uncomfortable um uh, because you don't feel qualified or you you're not uh, in a place where you feel worthy can often be a good thing um 
Desirable discomfort, I like to call it. Seek out difficult tasks. We've just been talking about this, uh, especially for things like new skills and new knowledge. Um, we were talking about skiing. Um, I have thoroughly, so I think it was three years ago, um, just after, it was the year after the pandemic, uh, I took up paddle boarding. Um, uh, two years ago, I took up skiing. Uh, I as I get older, I struggle to find things that test me mentally and physically. So I love taking on new, you know, I don't get nervous. I don't get anxious. I can't remember the last time I got nervous about anything. Um, so I really enjoy picking up a new task or a new challenge because anything that takes me out of my comfort zone adds to my bucket of confidence. So courage builds confidence. Doesn't matter. They don't have to be related. You can do anything that is a courageous act for you. It could be heights. It could be spiders. It could be driving around a track fast. Doesn't matter what it is. Anything that you do that is courageous for you builds your confidence levels. So, and again, this conversation I was having yesterday, um, confidence will give you the opportunity to gain competence. People will take a chance on you if you are confident in your manner. And confidence is a big element of positioning yourself as an expert. I, I, I would struggle, and I'm sure you would too, I would struggle to spend any time with someone, even if they've been 30 years in, if they didn't exude confidence when I sat talking to them about what they do. So anything that, and as like I say, it can be unrelated to anything that you do that takes you out of your comfort zone into the learning zone, anything that you do that for you is deemed courageous will help build your levels of confidence. Study less, test more, knowledge and learning. So love this one. Um, would you prefer to spend time with somebody that has uh, spent a hundred hours on and got all the ologies and certifications and qualifications on how to be a dentist? Or would you rather spend 50 hours, uh, sorry, spend time with somebody that had, was 50 hours in to actually fix in somebody's teeth. Of course, you need to be qualified. But uh, I, in fact, I've worked with coaches. I've coached coaches and I find it very challenging sometimes when they are on the continuous learning kind of process, which I get, you know, but they don't turn that knowledge into learning. They don't go out and use it. And it makes such a huge difference. Um, I remember, uh, again, personal story, very early days for me. I was off to see a millionaire in Bournemouth. And um, I rang my coach and said, I have no idea what I'm going to. If he asks me, you know, um, uh, what qualifications do I have an MBA? Do I like all of these kind of were going through my head. And my coach said to me, look. All you need to say to him, would you rather work with somebody that's read hundreds of books on how to paint houses or would you rather work with somebody that's painted hundreds of houses? So the, the, the whole concept here of the difference between knowledge and learning makes a huge difference in, um, again, comes back to confidence and uh, uh, positioning as an expert. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't study. Don't get me wrong. It's about making sure that you are balancing the knowledge that you take on board and turning that into uh, learning and doing. Get feedback. Um, we spoke about this briefly at the top of the shop. Uh, LBNT, every single event that I ever run, I ask myself afterwards, LB, what did I like best? This is how I review and reflect. What did I like best? And I list and NT, what would I do differently next time? What would I change? What would I alter? What would I do differently? It's a, I keep them all. I encourage anybody that's doing events. 
I use this process with them. Self-reflect. We're going to do this today. We're going to, you know, I'm going to stop sharing in a minute. It'll be over to you. Over to you. And then the silence is not golden. So you want to know. So uh, I can remember, and you need to do this the right way. So I can remember at a networking event, a lady standing up, so confrontational. I admired her um, ballsy um, fronting out and straight out asking her network, why aren't you guys giving me any referrals? That was the question. I have been coming here for over a year and I just don't get any kind of referrals from you. And I, um, it was way, way, way too confrontational uh, and accusational and um, was actually, uh, th there was a lack of ownership. Uh, but, I it was but you know it was it was on frustration so so the silence is not is not golden you want to know but it's asking the right way right so you need to solicit feedback on how you're doing so especially if you want to position yourself as an expert and if you're somebody that has got the yards in and you're not getting that um recognition is to you know kind of start asking yourself and your community why and that's what we're going to do next there you go. Recognize you're in for the long haul. It takes time. You can't hack the amount of time it takes to be recognized as an expert. Find a coach or mentor that will keep you just outside your comfort zone because human beings love to fall into their comfort zones. Start with what's important. Make sure you're focusing in on that 20% that will give you 80% back. Train like you fight. That's the 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 whole thing around. Um, uh, you know, don't look at it like a mock exam. Every time it's it's real. You know, go for it. Use desirable discomfort. Study less than test more, which is um, uh, we've just been doing, and then solicit feedback from somebody or people within your network that you like, know, and trust, and will give you good, honest feedback. Right. So some ways in which you can do it. <clears throat> um, there'll be something in here, I'm sure, that you're not doing that you could go away and do today. Micro specialize. So I talked back end of last year about niching your niche. So uh, in your marketing, not your product suite, you, it's all good to have a broad product suite, but actually niching down on your niche. So if your niche, for example, um let's say your niche let's say you're an accountant we've got an accountant on board let's say you're an accountant and you, you could specialize in construction or you could specialize in construction in devon so or you could specialize in construction in devon for residential so micro specialization um, is a great place to start building a special um, a, an expertise recognition. Um, I, this has become a very uh, uh, a lot more prevalent as a marketing tool. I've started to see people that have a generic uh, in like a website builder, for example, that only builds websites for charities. So I, I've seen this uh, more and more. So micro specializing is a fabulous, easy way into expertise. Getting on stage, which we've talked about already. Um, this goes right back to 2004 for me. Nowadays, we have digital stages. You know, there's an argument that says I'm on stage right now. Uh, back in 2004, the only stage was a stage. Um, the minute you walk into the spotlight, there's an expectation that you're an expert. It's up to you to kind of take that away. Um, TV, radio and podcasting. Uh, years ago, TV and radio probably wouldn't be accessible to a small business owner, but they certainly are now. Um, I've done a lot of uh, internet television that goes out to regional uh, um, um, areas, uh, uh, terrestrial, as you know, it's, it's originally done online, but it goes out to regional terrestrial as well radio is very accessible all through the pandemic i did a weekly slot 
on a local radio station here for over a year. I, I, I was invited on to do one and then they just keep it, kept on inviting me back. And then podcasting, of course, uh, we have podcasters in the NBA. So, and we will be doing podcasts in the NBA. Writing books. Again, I know we have authors. Um, in fact, we've got uh, at least one author online right now. So who've, who's written books. Um, I've coached clients that literally from start to finish have written books in the time that I've been working with them. So many simple tools now that are, make it accessible uh, for us to be able to put books together. Um, articles for professional publications. Be recognized or known as a problem solver, which is a fabulous uh, digital or social networks uh, uh, opportunity, solving problems for others. Uh, build a robust network. So the more people that know you, um, um, then the that that know what you do and how good you are then you know when others are asking then they're more likely to come to you so so the uh, solution for that would be go and build and and increase your network um and then awards accreditation certifications and achievements Again, rather than then come and tap you up, go out and seek them. I've worked with clients over the years that were ready for awards. And because th there are so many self uh, submission awards, but of course, you still need to be in a, you know, an award winning uh, position. And always be consistent. Probably one of the most important things. Uh, nobody is going to consider you an expert if you are inconsistent. So it's, it's like it under, underpins everything that you're trying to do. Right. So some things that you can do in the uh, underneath this video in the classroom. There are three documents, three PDFs for you to print off that you can spend some time filling in. So uh, so we're going to approach this in three ways. We're going to do two ways to look at other experts. And then the third element is for you to go away and um, review, reflect and revise what you're doing to be recognized as an expert. Right. First one. So three reasons and five things. So who do you know that is an expert? And then list three reasons why you would go to them for that thing rather than go to anybody else. And then five things that they've done to position themselves so that you would go to them. What is it that they've done? Why uh, did they come to mind um, over and above anybody else? What is it about them that made you think, yeah, they're an expert? Here's reasons why, three reasons why I'd go to them first. And here's five of the things that they've done that um, make me think of them as an expert. We already did this. Five things. Right. The second form, <clears throat> uh, which is essentially one form, but you've got three pages, is to think of three people that are experts um, and they could be different professions. So you may think, right, um, accountants, Becky Tyre is a zero expert. Um, let's go to um, Nikki. Nikki is a leadership training expert or uh, I don't know, but it's, I'm just, I, I don't want to, I probably shouldn't name people because then all those I don't name, I'm going to be in trouble for. But you could go different industries, right? So actually it would be a good thing to do. How long have they been? If you don't know, ask them. But here's the thing. You should know roughly how long they've been doing it. Um, what training, accreditation, qualification do they have? Are there testimonials and feedback uh, are they available? Can you see them? Can you find them? Are they in the public space? And then some one to tens. So how would you rate their reputation within their network? Would you feel comfortable <clears throat> describing them as an expert to others? Such a great question. So, you know, um, 
again, I need to be careful. So I have had clients that I would struggle to qualify as an expert if somebody said to me, are they an expert in that? So uh, so uh, it needs to be, they need to hit that mark. And then the last ones are out of 10. Are they trusted? Are they consistent? Are they confident? There's that word confidence, you see. And then are they capable? So do you trust them? Consistent again, are they confident? And are they capable of delivering? So score them out of 10. And then the last piece, so we've done, we've looked outward at other people as our models, our role models, people that we've identified that are expert in what they do. And then we've got two pages for you to fill in, which is a self-reflection. So what patterns do I notice amongst the experts that I listed? So, for example, they've all been in business for over five, six years. Um, they all have good testimonials on their website. They have accreditation. They have books that I don't know. Um, how do my skills and experience, you know, so where's the gaps? What is it that I'm missing? What specific actions can I take? Love this one should be in red. What can I do to improve my positioning? What areas of my professional development uh, require the most attention? What um, testable information say about me? So soliciting feedback, which we've talked about. Um, how can I strengthen my reputation? Uh, so reputation is what people are saying about you when you're not there. Um, strengthening your reputation um, is, is a proactive, you know, you need to be building stronger relationships. Uh, there are some people in the MBA that are incredibly good at this. So generous, complimentary, supportive. This is why I love the MBA so much. Uh, I do hope that we get some more of those lovely people across from the Facebook group because there was some amazing, uh, very, very giving people within uh, within the MBA. Um, how can I strengthen my reputation within my network? So, oh, I've uh, got a duplication. So I will we'll amend the form. I can't remember what I had in there. Uh, what barriers or challenges do I face in becoming recognized? So what's in the way? Is it how long you've been doing what you've been doing? Is it because you lack testimonials? Is it maybe that um, your confidence isn't where it needs to be? Anyway. Uh, something for you to self-reflect and review on based on what you've seen in other people. There you go. So let me stop the share and uh, come back to you. Um, I hope you enjoyed our first um, proper masterclass. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed sharing. Um, it 45 minutes, um, palatable time scale, I would think. Uh, thank you for joining me today, those that were here live. If you have any questions, um, uh, I think the best place to put those questions will be in the MBA. I will tag a comment to the uh, bottom of the video once it gets uploaded. And um, yeah, please uh, do leave your comments, your questions, uh, and certainly your um, uh, any input that you've got on how best to position um, yourself as an expert or anybody else for that matter. So thank you for joining me today. I uh, hope you found it useful. Um, we look forward to catching up with you next Friday on the six departments of every business. If you can't watch it live, you'll be able to watch it um, on playback. Uh, all the things in here uh, are all part of your membership. So um, we look forward to catching up with you on the next masterclass. Thanks again. Bye for now.